Good morning. Buenos dias. I call to order the meeting and hereby declare open the 13th session of the Conference of States Parties to the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, I recognize the presence of the following distinguished participants. His Excellency, Mr. Antonio Guterres, Secretary General of the United Nations. His Excellency, Volkan Boskir, President of the General Assembly. I welcome all distinguished delegates and participants to this meeting. Distinguished delegates, this meeting takes place during challenging times because of the global COVID-19 pandemic. It is important to strictly follow the occupational and safety health plan that allows this meeting to take place. Any large group meeting in an enclosed space such as this represents a risk to both delegates and the secretariat staff supporting the meeting. Your efforts to comply with the new requirements for a safe meeting are critical not only to the safe conduct of this meeting, but also to the meeting that may follow. Therefore, please kindly maintain physically, physical distancing of at least six feet, two meters at all time. This includes refraining from physical contacts such as handshakes when greeting your colleagues, wear your face covering or mask at all times, although you, move, you may remove it if you wish when addressing the meeting. Use the hand sanitizer provided at stations throughout the room and most importantly, do not attend or stay in the meeting if you become unwell with fever or other symptoms of COVID-19. This perhaps represents the highest risk to our safety. Please ensure you keep your seat in the current position, which has been set to meet the physical distancing requirements and ensure the safety of those seated across the aisle from you. Delegates may speak from where they are or may reposition their seat directly behind their nameplate when addressing the meeting. Please move back to your original position as soon as you have finished speaking. Distinguished representatives, part of the Occupational Safety and Health Plan of this meeting includes the possibility of follow-up in the in unfortunate and hopeful unlikely event of a case of COVID-19. Therefore, if any delegate develops symptoms of COVID-19 or has a positive COVID-19 test during the next 14 days, the United Nations Medical Director strongly encourages you to contact the medical service. The UN clinic will undertake normal contact tracing process, which is entirely confidential and all information will remain anonymous. Testing can also be arranged through the UN clinic if required. As a further effort to ensure that this in-person meeting during the COVID-19 crisis can succeed its objective of electing nine members of the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, please note that the delegations and the civil society representatives that wish to make statements are encouraged to send their statement electronically to the Secretariat for inclusion in the official record of the meeting. Lastly, as, law, as you are aware, only one representative per delegation is allowed access in, to this meeting to elect the nine members of the committee, with the exception of those delegations that have tellers. Should the second round of voting will be required in the afternoon, please make sure 
the same representative who registered with the Secretariat will present in the afternoon as well. We will proceed with item two, which is the adoption of the agenda. A provisional agenda was issued in document CRPD slash CSP slash 2020 slash one. May I now take it that the conference adopts the draft agenda for its 13th session? It's so decided. Agenda item three. A list of non-governmental organizations requesting accreditation to the conference was circulated to all state parties on 28th of October 2020 in accordance with the rules of procedure of the conference. The Secretariat has re received no objections to the 23 NGOs requesting accreditation. It is therefore understood that these NGOs may participate as observers. It is so decided. In accordance with established practice, the conference wishes to welcome the participation of national human rights institutions as observers, including the Global Alliance for National Human Rights Institutions. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I, have, I now have the honor to present a video opening message of His Excellency Luis Gallegos, Minister of Foreign Affairs and Human Mobility of Ecuador, to welcome you today in our capacity as President of the conference. May I ask the Secretariat to screen the video, please? Es un honor. It's, it's an honor to uh, welcome the opening session of the 13th uh, session of Conference of States Parties of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Uh, we're grateful for your presence in this forum, which has become one of the most uh, important and significant at the global level on issues of uh, persons with disability. We have planned this major event together with members of the Bureau of the states parties, uh, the UN system, and non-governmental uh, organizations to meet and to engage in dialogue on a common goal. That is the full implementation of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities to promote uh, the human rights and move towards an inclusive and sustainable development for persons with disabilities. We meet today after a very difficult period for all of us and that forced us to postpone this session uh, as it was originally planned for June. And uh, while, while we're still in the midst of a crisis due to the COVID-19 pandemic, which has uh, sorely tested our economies and health uh, care systems around the world, we meet today to uh, make progress on implementing the convention and to join our efforts to uh, achieve a more inclusive and egalitarian world. Persons with disability around the world and after the pandemic could be exposed to greater risks of infection. They could be affected by the interruption of essential health care services, by layoffs and difficulty in access to education, and other situations that uh, uh, lead to um, that that undermine their basic human rights. This is why this session uh, is characterized by actions taken by governments to prevent the spread of the pandemic and combat the current economic crisis. And uh, this session is concerned and focused on the well-being of our fellow citizens with disabilities. It's also an opportunity for us to highlight the need to adopt a integrated approach 
to leave no one behind and especially not leave anyone with disabilities. These persons must be considered as a priority group in the government responses to the pandemic and measures to ensure economic recovery afterwards. Dear friends, we have uh, gone a long path over the past 75 years to uphold the fundamental values enshrined in the UN Charter. We've adopted a series of international human rights instruments that defend the rights and dignity of uh, all, including those the most vulnerable. One of these instruments was the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which was adopted on the 13th of December of 2006 in this same headquarters. I chaired the negotiations on this instrument. It was the first a comprehensive treaty of human rights of the 21st century and the first human rights convention open to signature by regional integration organizations. The convention entered into force on the 3rd of May 2008 after decades of work in order to change attitudes and approaches to persons with disability. Today they have become true subjects of rights. They are able to demand that their rights be upheld and take decisions on their lives based on free and informed consent. Currently, we have 182 states' parties to the convention committed to promoting the rights uh, of persons with disabilities and their inclusion. Today, we are inaugurating the 13th Conference of States' Parties, which is a, a, a major event that will offer an, uh, new opportunities to reflect on experiences and lessons learned over the past few years and identify uh, uh, gaps and strengthen our public policies and improve practices to Im fully implement the convention. As I have stated uh, previously, any crisis could become an opportunity. Dep it depends on all of us to ensure that the world that emerges from this pandemic is a world that's more just, free of discrimination and violence. This is a historic event that could lead to a broad support uh, to resolve uh, and tackle social problems and promote human rights w uh, with a specific emphasis on persons with disability. We need to work for the in inclusion and better access for persons with disability to health care services on equal conditions with everyone, including medication, vaccines, and medical equipment, as well as to ensure that critical information on the crisis and its impact is available in uh, accessible formats. Also, we need to make sure that the per persons with disability and their representative organizations participate in all stages of the response and recovery from COVID-19. This is essential so that uh, persons with disability are at the heart of our efforts. I wish everyone a very successful session. Thank you once again for your cooperation and readiness to persevere and to keep moving forward with this, with this noble cause. Thank you very much on behalf of Ecuador and on behalf of persons with disability. Thank you. Gracias. Thank you. Al ministro. Thank you to the minister. I know I have to great I have uh, the great uh, honor to invite His Excellency Mr. Antonio Guterres, Secretary General of the United Nations to deliver a statement. I ask uh, protocol to escort the Secretary General to the podium. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to join you for the 13th session of the Conference of States Parties to the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Later this week, we'll also observe the International Day of Persons with Disabilities. I take this issue of disability inclusion extremely seriously. Securing the rights of persons with disabilities is necessary for upholding the values and principles of the United Nations Charter. That is why last year I launched a UN system-wide disability inclusion strategy. Its aim is to bring about lasting and transformative change in the organization's work on disability inclusion across its policies, programs and operations. The strategy will contribute to the implementation of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals. One year on, 
the strategy is having a tangible impact. In my first report to the General Assembly this year, 57 entities reported on their progress, as well as seven country teams that are participating in the early rollout of the country team accountability scorecard on disability inclusion. The report provides the first comprehensive assessment of disability inclusion within the UN system. It presents an honest picture of where we are and shows where we need to improve, and we need to improve a lot. For the most part, the system is still just beginning to consider disability inclusion in a comprehensive and coordinated matter, whether uh, in relation to humanitarian action, human rights, or sustainable development. But overall, the report demonstrates that the strategy has triggered action across the UN system. It has raised awareness and created a platform co for coordination and knowledge sharing on disability inclusion. I feel that we have a collective commitment and a collective ambition to make progress. Distinguished delegates, this year's conference is taking place in unprecedented circumstances. The COVID-19 pandemic has been affecting communities and societies at their very core, deepening pre-existing inequalities. Even under normal circumstances, the one billion persons with disabilities worldwide are less likely to enjoy access to education, health care, and livelihoods, or to participate and be included in the community in all its dimensions. They are more likely to live in poverty and experience higher, experience higher rates of violence, neglect, and abuse. And when crisis grips communities, persons with disabilities are among the worst affected. The pandemic is exacerbating these inequalities and producing new threats. In May this year, I issued a dedicated policy brief on COVID-19 and persons with disabilities, which highlighted the disproportionate impact of the pandemic. I called for our response and recovery to be more disability inclusive. Promoting inclusion of persons with disabilities means, first of all, recognizing and protecting their rights. And these rights touch on every aspect of life. The right to go to school, to live in one's community, to access health care, to start a family, to engage in political participation, to be able to play sport or to travel, and to have decent work. Through the implementation of the disability inclusion strategy, the UN system is working to lead by example. We want to be an employer of choice for persons with disabilities, and I hope we will manage. We must also ensure that the vision and aspirations of persons with disabilities are included and accounted for in a disability-inclusive, accessible and sustainable post-COVID-19 world, post world. This vision will only be achieved through active consultation with persons with disabilities and their representative organizations. And so we must ensure their full participation of persons with disabilities and their organizations in decision-making processes. As uh, we move forward, we must take a whole-of-society approach to ensure, to ensure disability inclusion. Only by working together, governments, civil society, UN entities, including also the organizations of persons with disabilities, the private sector and communities of experts, can we effectively implement the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and tackle the obstacles, the injustices, and the discrimination that persons with disabilities experience? Realizing the rights of persons with disabilities is crucial to fulfilling the core promise of the 2030 Agenda to leave no one behind. In all our actions, our goal is clear. A world in which all persons can enjoy equal opportunities participation in decision-making, and truly benefit from economic, social, political, and cultural life. That is a goal worth fighting for. That is our goal, and I thank you. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. I know now, I now have the honor to invite His Excellency, Mr. Volkan Boskir, President of the General Assembly, to deliver a statement 
I ask uh, protocol to escort the president of the General Assembly to the podium. Excellencies, Mr. Secretary General, thank you for the opportunity to address this 13th session of the Conference of State Parties to the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. I welcome the theme of this year's conference, a decade of action and delivery for inclusive, sustainable development, implementing the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and the 2030 Agenda for Persons with Disabilities. Excellencies, it is easy, while under the shadow of COVID-19, to press pause on the commitments we have made. This is understandable. The entire planet is faced with a crisis unparalleled in scale and mired in uncertainty. Yet this too shall pass. With news each day of vaccine developments and with collective effort to ensure vaccines for all, with fair and equitable access, we have reason to hope of an end to this crisis. This makes it all the more important that we do not ignore our long-term goals, particularly those that have been painstakingly crafted over decades and which focus on those most vulnerable. Allow me to make three brief points to this end. First, as we look to the longer-term recovery from COVID-19, we must embrace the Sustainable Development Goals as our blueprint for a sustainable, resilient recovery from COVID-19. The decade of action on the SDGs, while seemingly set back by the pandemic, can be a springboard to bounce back further and faster. As we pour incredible amounts of resources into the recovery effort, let this be guided by the principles exposed in those goals. Second, the needs of those most vulnerable must always be at the forefront of our thoughts. Consider for a moment the frustration of women and girls with disabilities, particularly those in developing countries, who have struggled to overcome obstacle after obstacle to secure education or health care or jobs and livelihoods. We owe it to them to ensure that our efforts now help to recover the losses incurred and to expedite progress where needed. And finally, let us ensure that our recovery efforts include the voices and leadership of persons with disabilities. As they have so clearly stated, nothing for us without us. As the world undertakes this unparalleled recovery effort, let us highlight the experience and leadership of persons with disabilities in addressing COVID-19. At the same time, efforts to ensure the full participation of persons with disabilities in recovery planning must be made. Excellencies, in closing, Allow me to emphasize that, as with sessions past, the needs of persons with disabilities remains a priority for the 75th session as well. Accessibility is crucial to facilitating the participation of persons with disabilities, and as such, mainstreaming disability throughout the United Nations system must remain a consistent priority. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Excellency. I now ask the Secretariat to screen a recorded message from Mr. Danlami Umaru Basharu, the Chair of the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. 
Secretary General Guterres, President of the Conference Espinoza, Excellencies, Distinguished Delegates. Thank you to the Bureau of the State's Parties to the CRPD for its invitation to speak at the opening of the 13th session. I would like to highlight four aspects in my intervention. First, the impact of COVID-19 on the rights of persons with disabilities. I welcome the overarching theme of a decade of action and delivery for inclusive, sustainable development and acknowledge the positive measures adopted globally to implement the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and the 2030 Agenda. At the, States, at the same time, I am extremely concerned that the pandemic has exacerbated all of the structural barriers, exclusion and discrimination that persons with disabilities regularly face. While I celebrate that there are now 182 parties to the convention, the pandemic has made evident that there is still a long way to go in fully understanding the human rights model of disability enshrined in the convention and therefore in fully implementing its provisions. I recall that the convention is the standard for disability inclusive planning and recovery measures and the roadmap to fulfill the goals of the 2030 Agenda in a manner that is inclusive of 15% of the world population. Turning to the work of the committee throughout the pandemic and challenges experienced, the committee continues its mandate online except constructive dialogues and met virtually on three occasions. Comprehensive information about the session and pre-sessions is available in the committee's webpage. We continued valuable engagement with civil society representatives who brought to our attention the voices and concerns of persons with disabilities throughout this period. I commend all those states parties that have uh, engaged in meaningful consultation with persons with disabilities to guide their response to the committee. Virtual work of the committee is an exceptional measure that comes with several challenges and the right technology must be found. Unfortunately, it has exacerbated the lack of accessibility and the lack of reasonable, uh, the lack of provision of reasonable accommodation in UN meetings. The online platforms pose several challenges, one of which is inaccessibility for persons with visual impairment, resulting in a committee members having no choice but to rely on the support of personal assistance whose work is not financially compensated by the UN. Although the UN Disability Inclusion Strategy and General Assembly Resolution 68268 refer to the provision of reasonable accommodation, currently a sustainable framework for the provision of individual disability specific adjustments for members with disabilities is yet to be implemented within the UN. As part of the commitment to the rights of persons with disabilities, I call upon the UN and six parties to ensure that the principles and standards of the convention guide the development of reasonable accommodation policies to ensure their immediate non-discrimination duties in the context of disability. In this regard, it will be advisable to create a reasonable accommodation fund ready to be accessed through simplified administrative procedures for the effective participation of persons with disabilities as required. Next, I will refer to progress in the draft general comment on the right to work and employment. The committee is preparing a general comment on the right to work and employment for persons with disabilities with support from the International Labour Organization. Together, we will seek to ensure that all efforts to achieve the Sustainable Development Goal 8, Target 8.5 are guided by the Convention. The committee will work intersectionally with a view to drafting an outline to post on its website, inviting all relevant stakeholders to provide inputs and potentially convening a day of general discussion in its next in-person session. Mr. Laszlo Lovasi, coordinator of the committee's um, task force on the draft general comment, will address you tomorrow in panel one and may provide additional information. Finally, in order to expedite action for implementing the CRPD, particularly to ensure that the voices of persons with disabilities are included in international fora such as this one. I call on states parties to consider the establishment of a voluntary fund 
to improve accessibility within the United Nations and beyond to give full effect to the United Nations Disability Inclusion Strategy. Let me close by expressing my sincere hope that today's elections will contribute to upholding balanced uh, gender representation, diversity, and inclusion in the committee. The committee looks forward to the possibility of engaging with states parties in person again, and I also look forward to the next few days to continue this dialogue to advance the realization of the rights of persons with disabilities. Thank you. Thank you. We shall proceed to view a recorded message by Mr. Gerard Quinn, the Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Secretary General, uh, Mr. President, Excellencies, distinguished delegates and participants, I speak to you today as the incoming United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. I wish to thank the Bureau for the invitation to participate in the opening of the Conference of States Parties to the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Allow me at the outset to pay tribute to the outgoing Special Rapporteur, Catalina de Vandes Aguirre of Costa Rica. Her work was truly inspiring and pioneering, and I can only hope to be a worthy successor. Looking back, we had come to expect the slow but steady progress of the UNCRPD and especially the new framing on disability that it exemplifies. How wrong we were. Basic truths of a habit of coming to the surface during a crisis. So it was with COVID-19. Basic services were swept away. Preventive measures were not adequately communicated food, nutrition, and healthcare services were rationed, institutions became even more obviously dangerous places to be. Home became an incredibly dangerous place for women and girls with disabilities. As the Disability Rights Monitor report of October has shown vividly, the old framing of disability as persons were as objects and not as subjects came to the surface during the crisis, and we've been trying to put it to one side ever since. Looking forward, it's clear that the global community needs to find better ways of giving reality to the framings of disability in the UNCRPD. Systems do not necessarily change just because headline ideas do. We need deep systems change to ensure that new ideas actually reach the small places where people live. By focusing on systemic change across a broad range of domains, the UN SDGs give a powerful impetus to the UN CRPD. The CRPD implies these changes, but the UN SDGs go directly to them. It's often stressed that the UN SDGs are grounded in, are bounded by human rights. I agree, but I also see them as giving fresh impetus to human rights. It's a two-way street. There is therefore a natural marriage between the two instruments, and I greatly welcome the growing trend within the UN Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities of referring to the UN SDGs to reinforce their analysis and conclusions under the UN CRPD. Much of my future work agenda will have to do with systems change. This work will range from the responses to COVID-19 to climate change and indeed preparing for future crises that will face humanity in the future. And much of my future thematic work will include those left furthest behind, including indigenous persons with disabilities, older persons with disabilities, and indeed prisoners with disabilities. Naturally, I see the CRPD and the UN SDGs as being equally applicable and relevant. I very much look forward to your deliberations and, as always, look forward to the rich debates that typically characterise 
the main sessions of the Conference of State Parties and the many side panels that have always marked COSP apart. Thank you very much. Thank you. I now ask the Secretariat to screen a, record, a recorded message from Ms. Maria Soledad Cisternas Reyes, Special Envoy on Disability and Accessibility, followed by a short video clip that is part of her campaign on universal accessibility, which is being launched today at this special gathering. Please. Muy buenos días. A very good morning to you. The 2020-2030 Decade of Action is a call for us to promote ideas that will reach solutions. As we do so, we are compelled to admit that the COVID-19 pandemic has exposed the major obstacles to full implementation of the CRPD and to achieving the SDGs. This in turn means that we must also focus on the cross-cutting themes that will have the greatest impact. When we looked into the difficulties experienced by persons with disabilities in gaining access to health care in many hospitals and care centers, as well as in gaining access to food, medicines, personal attention and care, and in exercising their rights, such as their rights to education and work during the lockdown, the common element we found was the lack of or inadequate universal accessibility. Universal accessibility includes not only physical spaces, but also information, communications, technology, transport, and accessing services, which also requires proper training for staff in those areas. We have reached the 12-year mark in the life of our convention with 182 states parties, and yet the legal obligation to provide accessibility has not yet been fully met. I am convinced that creating global big data to address the critical situation of accessibility during and after the pandemic, especially when it comes to healthcare, will be something that we can bequeath to humanity to better tackle other humanitarian emergencies in the future and enable our communities and governments to identify the nexus between accessibility, human rights, and sustainable development. Another overarching issue is the situation facing women and girls with disabilities. Girls and women have disproportionately borne the negative effects of the pandemic, such as increased violence and abuse, especially during quarantines. It is now patently clear that there are still no appropriate protocols or policies in place to address this situation. This is an urgent challenge to the Beijing Plus 25 review, which will take place in 2021. It is for this reason that I am calling on the Commission on the Status of Women to ensure that in its resolution in March 2021, it focuses maximum attention to this issue, as well as the issue of the participation of women with disabilities in political and public life and realization of their rights, in accordance with the General Assembly Resolution on Inclusive Development for and with persons with disabilities passed recently on the 3rd of November. What is required is clear guidance for women-centered ministries and agencies around the world. The Generation Equality Forum scheduled for next year should be attended by actual women with disabilities and their representative organizations. We are talking about more than 500 million women with disabilities in the world who cannot wait any longer. In closing, and 
here again, pursuant to the General Assembly Resolution on Inclusive Development, I believe it is vital that the private sector finds a way to undertake a political commitment to sustainable development, for example, by providing workplace accessibility so that persons with disability can be fully integrated into the workforce and so that goods and services are accessible to everyone. They can also strengthen leadership for sustainable development by channeling a percentage of their earnings into sustainable investment, into universal accessibility in public spaces, for example. Ultimately, implementing the CRPD and achieving the SDGs will mean global gains in dignity and rights in our COVID-19 response and inclusive recovery from the pandemic. Thank you very much. Accessibility, pillar and bridge for the exercise of human rights and fundamental freedoms. Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, United Nations. Persons with disabilities represent around 15% of the world's population, which is equivalent to more than 1 billion persons who face several barriers to their full and effective inclusion in society. Persons with disabilities have the right to be autonomous, to live independently, and to be included in the community. Therefore, we must promote universal accessibility as a human right so that our cities are inclusive, safe, resilient, progressing towards sustainable development, leaving no one behind. 2030 Agenda, United Nations Sustainable Development Goal, number 11. To improve accessibility in both urban and rural areas, we must apply principles, guidelines, and standards on universal design in all facilities and services open to the public or for public use, including the removal of obstacles and barriers. Implement or improve accessibility in physical spaces, such as buildings, public roads, transportation, schools, housing, hospitals or medical facilities, workplaces, stadiums, cultural centers, recreation and sports, among others. Promote access to information and communication services, including those needed in situations of emergency. Promote access and use for persons with disabilities to new information and communication technologies and systems including the internet. Buildings and other facilities must include accessible signage. Different forms of personalized assistance, such as guides, readers, and professional sign language interpreters should be offered to facilitate accessibility to buildings and other facilities open to the public. Provide training, including training in universal design and accessibility to all public and private institutions that provide services to the public as well as to the community. We all must be aware that we live in diverse, dynamic and interactive societies and that the commitment of governments including local governments and municipalities, is essential to ensure that accessibility is a fundamental pillar in all cities, creating a bridge so that all persons can enjoy all their human rights and fundamental freedoms. Let's promote accessibility as a commitment for society as a whole. Produced by the Special Envoy of the United Nations Secretary General on Disability and Accessibility, Maria Soledad Cisternas Reyes, Year 2020.
Thank you. Next, we have a recorded message from Mr. Idris Alzouma Maiga as a civil society representative who will address the state parties of the CRPD.
I will leave you with this idea. This is no longer a public health crisis. This is a crisis of what we stand for, including persons with disability and the representative organization in all response. Recovery and the rebuilding will help to ensure we real to build back better. Thank you so much. I thank Mr. Maiga for his message, as I thank other uh, representatives who have spoken today. Uh, we will be hearing from them during the coming days at the side events and uh, round tables. We have uh, now reached the end of the, our opening sessions, and I wish to take this opportunity to express my great appreciation to His Excellency, the Secretary General and the President of the General Assembly, and all the representatives at this opening for their statements. Now, um, I move on to the next agenda item, that is item seven, decisions to be considered for adoption by the conference of the state's parties. Colleagues, the Bureau, in consultation with our regional groups, proposed to this conference three decisions. The draft of these three decisions was introduced to the delegations via your regional, your regional representatives in the Bureau, seeking approval by consensus by 25th November 2020. Since no objections, uh, so since no objection was received by 25th November, in my capacity as the president of the bureau and the conference, I invite states parties to take action to endorse these proposals, by which we will decide the following: that the 14th session will be scheduled tentatively to take place from 15th to 17th June 2021. That we recommend to the Secretary General that future sessions of the conference be provided adequate support for six meetings. and to further request the Secretary General to transmit the report of this session to the conference to all state parties and observers in due course. I see no objection. May I take that the conference would adopt the decisions as proposed? It's so adopted. I thank colleagues for their cooperation and support for this matter. Distinguished delegates, the meeting of state parties will now proceed with agenda item four. Election of the members of the committee on the rights of persons with disabilities in accordance with Article 34 of the Convention. I would like to remind you that only state parties to the, con the, to the CRPD can participate and vote during the election. Before we begin, delegations are hereby requested to strictly adhere to the safety and health mitigating measures set out with regard to the conduct conduct of the balloting, which are of particular concern as they involve the movement of numerous delegates in this hall. The non-respect of these guidelines may lead to reclassification of the meeting as high risk, which will have an adverse impact 
on the continuation of the proceedings and on their resumption. With the assistance of the Occupational Safety and Health representatives, I will oversee the implementation of such mitigation measures in the course of these proceedings. If at any moment it appears that the guidelines are not being strictly observed, I will have no choice but to draw the attention of delegates to these guidelines and suspend or adjourn the meeting as needed. In a similar vein, I want to recall that the human rights treaty bodies, including the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, have continued to exercise their mandate stemming, stemming from the human rights treaties albeit with changed dynamics such as having to temporarily use online working methods. Whilst having in-person meetings in Geneva remains the default, however, for, this foresee for the foreseeable time, it will be therefore be important for members of the CRPD committee to have the capacity to work online during sessions. Distinguished delegates, this is an election in accordance with Article 34 of the Convention of the Rights of Persons with Disabilities of nine members of the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities to replace those whose terms are due to expire on 31st December 2020. I wish to draw your attention to certain provisions contained in Article 34 of the Convention. Article 34, paragraph 5 provides that, I quote, the members of the committee shall be elected by secret ballot from a list of persons nominated by the state parties from among their nationals at meetings of the conference of the state's parties, close quote. Furthermore, continue the quote, at those meetings for which two thirds of the state parties shall continue, con constitute a quorum, the persons elected to the committee shall be those who obtain the largest number of votes and an absolute majority of the votes of the representative state parties presenting at, present at voting. Article 34, paragraphs three and four provide that members serve in their personal capacity and shall be of high moral standing and recognized competence and experience in the field covered by the convention. When electing committee members, state parties are invited to give consideration to equitable geographical distribution, representation of the different forms of civilization and of the principal legal systems, balance, gender representation, and participation of experts with disabilities. The nine members whose terms are due to expire on 31st December 2020 are the following. Mr. Ahmad Al Saif, Saudi Arabia. Mr. Montian Buntan of Thailand. Mr. Imed Edin Chaker of Tunisia. Mr. Jun Ishikawa of Japan. Mr. Samuel Nyinguna Kabue of Kenya. Mr. Laszlo Gabor Lovaski of Hungary. Mr. Robert George Martin of New Zealand. Mr. Martin Babu Mewisigawa of Uganda. And Dmitry Rebrov of the Russian Federation. In a note verbal dated 10 February 2020, in accordance with Article 34, paragraphs 5 and 6 of the Convention, the Secretary General invited state parties of the Convention to submit their nominations for membership of the committee within two months. As a result of the announcement of the postponement of the 13th session of the Conference of State Parties due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the deadline for nomination of nine members of the committee was extended until 1 October 2020, 
in accordance with Article 34, Paragraph 6 of the Convention. The Secretary General prepared a list of alphabetical order of the 28 candidates thus nominated, including their biographic, biographical details in document CRPD slash CSP slash 2020 slash CRP1. On 26 November, the Secretariat received the withdrawal of Mr. Muhannad al of Jordan. As of today, there are 27 nominations for the nine vacancies. If there are no further nominations or withdrawals, we should proceed with election on the basis of these 27 nominations. The 27 nominated candidates are Rosa Idalia Aldana Salguero, Guatemala, Mr. Ahmad Al Saif of Saudi Arabia, Mr. Yahya Al Farsi of Oman, Ms. Euphemia Maria Julia Amela, Amela from Mozambique, Ms. Soumia Amrani from Morocco, Ms. Claire Lucille Azoparty Lane of Malta, Mr. Tambo Demba Camara of Mauritania, Mr. Imet Edin Chaker of Tunisia, Mr. Magino Corporan Lorenzo from the Dominican Republic, Mr. Momuni Diarra of Mali, Ms. Jarel Dondorvorjok from Mongolia, Mr. Yatma Fal, Senegal, Ms. Vivian Fernandez de Torrijo, from Panama. Ms. Odelia Fitousi from Israel. Ms. Sif Holst from Denmark. Ms. Ivanka Jovanovic from Serbia. Mr. Samuel Kabue from Kenya. Ms. Lizat Kaltayeva from Kazakhstan. Ms. Maria Cristina Cronfle Gomez from Ecuador. Mr. Robert George Martin of New Zealand, Mr. Floyd Morris of Jamaica, Mr. Joseph Najizenga of Burundi, Ms. Katarzyna Rosenska of Poland, Ms. Julia Sachkuk from Ukraine, Ms. Saovalak Tongyukai of Thailand, Mr. Yuri Toplak of Slovenia, Ms. Benafasha Yakobi of the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan. Distinguished delegates, I would like to invite the following persons. I would like to invite the tellers to approach the ballot boxes and check that the boxes are empty. I would like to invite now the tellers to come to the podium to act as tellers following the nomination by their regional groups. The tellers are Ms. Carol Staunton from the Permanent Mission of Ireland, Ms. Karin Wong from the Permanent Mission of Singapore, 
Ms. Vivian Lombe from the Permanent Mission of Liberia, Mr. Joao Carlos Falseta Sanini from the Permanent Mission of Brazil, Ms. Victoria Sass from the Permanent Mission of Hungary, and Ms. Dinushi Sonali Rupatunga from the Permanent Mission of Sri Lanka. We shall now proceed with the election. All delegates should have obtained their ballots from the East Document Center located towards the back of the General Assembly Hall. Two thirds of the state parties should constitute a quorum for the election and the Secretariat has confirmed that we have a quorum required for today's election. Distinguished delegates, concerning the ballots, representatives may vote only for the candidates whose names appear on the ballot papers. Voting for a candidate is done by placing a cross in the box of the left of the candidate's name. Blank ballot papers will be considered abstentions. Ballot papers marked for more candidates than the number of seats indicated will be considered invalid. If a ballot contains any notation other than the votes in favor of a specific candidates, those notations will be disregarded. Other than to cast their ballots, all representatives should remain seated during the meeting. No photography will be allowed during the balloting. The ballot box is placed at the front of right of the General Assembly Hall, where tellers will be able to observe the casting of ballots. For the casting of ballots, I will call the name of each state party in English alphabetical order and ask the state party concerned to proceed to cast their ballot. Representatives are requested to practice distancing of no less than two meters and to proceed to the caster ballot only when the previous representative has completed casting their ballot. This will continue until the last representative has cast their ballot. In order to minimize the risk posed by prolonged exposure and crowding, representatives are requested to leave the General Assembly Hall upon, casting their, uh, upon the casting of the ballot through the exit of the west side. Once all ballots are cast, the meeting will be suspended and the conference officers accompanied by the tellers will proceed to the Trustship Council for the counting of the ballots. Upon receipt of the results certified by the tellers, I will immediately circulate a letter to all state parties in order to inform delegations of the results and to declare elected those candidates that have received the greatest number of votes and a required majority of the state parties present at vote in voting. I will also announce the results through the webcast. The announcement will also contain information concerning the date, time and venue for the following balloting as needed. I wish to draw attention that Rule 19 of the Rules of Procedure for the Conference of States Parties as set in document CRPD slash CSP slash 2008 slash 3, should a second round and subsequent rounds of balloting be necessary, restricted balloting shall apply as set out in, in Rule 19 of the Rules of Procedure as applicable. In this regard, if another round of balloting is required, it will commence this afternoon at 4 p.m. in this hall, with staggered arrival time starting at 3 p.m. Before we begin the voting process, I would like to remind delegations that no representative shall interrupt the voting except on a point of order on the actual conduct of the voting. All representatives are also requested to remain at their seats so that the voting process 
can proceed in an orderly manner, and the appropriate safety precautions can be taken in this circumstance. I thank you all for your cooperation. We shall now begin the voting process. I request representatives to use only those ballot papers that have been provided to them. May I take it that the meeting agrees to this procedure? I see no objections. It is so decided. I will now I will now call delegations in English alphabetical order to approach the ballot box and cast their vote. Please refrain from leaving your seat until being called upon. Afghanistan, followed by Albania, followed by Algeria, Andorra, Angola, Antigua and Barbuda, Argentina, Armenia, Australia, Austria, Azerbaijan, Bahamas, Bahrain, Bangladesh, Barbados, Belarus, Belgium, Belize, Benin, Bolivia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Brazil, Brunei Darussalam, Bulgaria, Burkina Faso, Burundi, Cabo Verde, Cambodia, Canada, Central African Republic, Chad, Chile, China, Colombia, Comoros, Congo, Cook Islands, Costa Rica, Cote d'Ivoire, Croatia, Cuba, Cyprus, Czech Republic, Democratic People's Republic of Korea, Democratic Republic of the Congo, Denmark, 
Djibouti, Dominika, Dominican Republic, Ecuador, Egypt, El Salvador, Estonia, Eswatini, Etiopía, Fiji, Finland, France, Gabón, Gambia, Georgia, Germany, Ghana, Greece, Grenada, Guatemala, Guinea, Guinea Bissau, Guyana, Haiti, Honduras, Hungary, Iceland, India, Indonesia, Iran, Iraq, Ireland, Israel, Italy, Jamaica, Japan, Jordan, Kazakhstan. Kenya, Kiribati, Kuwait, Kyrgyzstan, Lao People's Democratic Republic, Latvia, Lesotho, Liberia, Libya, Lithuania, Luxembourg, Madagascar, Malawi, Malaysia, Maldives, Mali, Malta, Marshall Island, Mauritania, Mauritius, Mexico, Micronesia, Monaco, 
Mongolia. Montenegro. Morocco. Mozambique. Myanmar. Namibia. Nauru, Nepal, Netherlands, New Zealand, Nicaragua, Niger, Nigeria, North Macedonia, Norway, Oman, Pakistan, Palau, Panama, Papua New Guinea, Paraguay, Perú, Philippines, Poland, Portugal, Qatar, Republic of Korea, Republic of Moldova, Romania, Russian Federation, Rwanda, Samoa, San Marino, Sao Tome and Principe, Saudi Arabia, Senegal, Serbia, Seychelles, Sierra Leone, Singapore, Slovakia, Slovenia, Somalia, South Africa, Spain, Sri Lanka,
St. Kitts and Nevis, St. Lucia, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, the State of Palestine, Sudan, Suriname, Sweden, Switzerland, Syria Arab Republic, Thailand, Togo, Trinidad and Tobago, Tunisia, Turkey, Turkmenistan, Tuvalu, Uganda, Ukraine, United Arab Emirates, United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, United Republic of Tanzania, Uruguay, Vanuatu, Venezuela, Vietnam, Yemen, Zambia, Zimbabwe. The voting is now complete. I would like to invite the conference officers, accompanied by the tellers, to proceed to the Trustship Council for the counting of, of the ballots. Upon receipt of the results certified by the tellers, I will immediately circulate a letter of, to all state parties in order to inform delegations of the results and to declare the elected candidates. I will also announce the results throughout the webcast. The announcement will also contain information concerning the date, time, and venue for the following balloting as needed. In this regard, if another round of balloting is required, I will only commence this afternoon at 4 p.m. with delegates arrival time starting at 3 p.m. The meeting is suspended. Thank you very much. <laughs>